Good morning. Welcome to Gray Street United Church this morning. My name is Deborah Holoka. I am the chair of the leadership team here at Gray Street. I will now present the territorial acknowledgement. We live, work, and worship in Treaty 1 territory. As settler people, we live with respect on this, the homeland of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples, and the Métis Nation. Let us walk together in relationships that are just, right, and honorable, for we are all treaty people. We have some announcements this morning. As you may know, uh, Wendy Neplick has tested positive for COVID and, it, it, and is truly sorry she can't be with us for this service. However, she would like to thank everyone, especially those who filled in at the last minute for contributing to today's special worship service. This past week, we received a beautiful thank you card from John Black United Church for our congregation's generous donation and ongoing support to the Refugee Interest Group. Both the card and enclosed letter are posted on the bulletin board in the narthex, so you can read them if, if you're curious about that. Exciting news! We are having guests at our worship service on Sunday, November 13th the entire congregation of John Black United Church, including their choir and their Sunday school, will be joining us as we worship and learn more about the topic of justice and listen to our guest speaker, Linda Trono. Linda Trono is the one that ran that program that I attended for over a year there and was reporting on. So she's quite an animated speaker. I'm looking forward to it. Make sure you mark your calendars. The worship team would like to extend a welcome and a thank you to Morgan Neplick Beatty, Deborah Holoka, and our guest speaker today, Tom Axworthy, for leading and participating in the worship service, and to Heather Welby Smith as our piano accompanist this morning. You are invited to stay for a time of fellowship with coffee and dessert immediately following worship. This will be a great opportunity to meet and chat with our special guest, Tom Axworthy. The front screen is not helping us today. If you wish, there are hymn books on the offering table. Please help yourself, or you may turn around to view the screen at the back. But at this point, it seems to be working, but it may cut out. <laughs> so if you want to get yourself a hymn book now, <laughs> that would be fine. I think that's everything for that. Okay. We will now light the Christ candle. We are thankful in this autumn season of abundance for the richness of God's grace bestowed upon us in humbleness. We realize the depth of these blessings. We light the Christ candle to remind us that we are not to hide the light of Christ under a bushel basket or within the walls of a church building, but to take it out into the world so that everyone will know and experience God's love, God's peace, God's justice. Come, all who are thirsty, let us drink at God's well. We come, ready to have our thirst quenched with the living water.
loving God, creator of the earth, the skies, the water, O oh God, your living water fills our souls. Thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for always being with us at home, at school, at work, at play. O oh God, your living water fills our souls. When we feel lonely or sad, O oh God, your living water fills our souls. When we are frustrated or disappointed, O oh God, your living water fills our souls. When we feel empty or bored, O oh God, your living water fills our souls. When our souls are thirsty for you, O oh God, your living water fills our souls. May our souls be filled during this time of worship, O oh God, your living water fills our souls. Amen. Thank you, choir. That was lovely. Prayer of Confession. God of all, in the beginning you created. In the beginning you created all things. In the beginning 
You looked at everything and you said, this is good. How do you feel about it now? How do you feel about what we have done in our desire to grow, to constantly move forward? How do you feel about the damage we do, the damage we can't seem to keep ourselves from doing to this small part of our creation, to the land, to the earth, the air, the water, and all that life it sustains. Declare our word into your hearts, our minds, our lives, so that we might feel it, so that we might live it, and so that your creation may be good once again. Amen. We will now, what, the water song? Me. I thought 
I was loud enough. <laughs> Is it good? We're good. We're good. Sorry about that, folks. As you can see, my name is Cheryl Polo, and I am a little bit enthusiastic, a little bit animated, and a little bit childlike. So I get the honor today of introducing the uh, More Voices 92 Like a Rock. And it fills my inner child because there's actions and I'm going to teach them all to you so it's very simple I'm, I'm glad I took the words just in case uh, so basically we go like a rock please join me like a rock like a rock God is under our feet like the starry night sky God is over our head. Like the sun on horizon, God is ever before. Like the river runs to oceans, our home is in God evermore. If you're able, please stand and join us as we sing More Voices United, Like a Rock. <clears throat> like a rock, like a rock, God is under our feet, like a Open our spirits to receive the stories of your people. Oh God, open our hearts to notice our own story within them. Open our minds that we may be transformed by the act of listening and receiving. Amen. I'll be reading from John chapter 4, verses 1 to 26. Jesus talks with the Samaritan woman. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sakar, near the plot of the ground Jacob had given to his son. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For G Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who give us, gave us this well and drank from him himself, as he did with his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but everyone who drinks the water I give them will never, never thirst. 
Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me a drink of this water so I won't get thirsty and I won't have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is that you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are the prophet. Your ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that this place that we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming where you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and I and has now come for the true worshipers that will worship the Father in the spirit in the truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is the spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Thank you. Thank God. I now have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker today. <clears throat> Tom has had a distinguished career in government, academia, and philanthropy. He served as the principal secretary to Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Many in the water world will know Tom as his time as the president and CEO of the Walter and Duncan Gordon Foundation, where he championed the well-known data stream program. He is a former advisor to the Lake Winnipeg Foundation and is currently a member of the Forum to the, for the Leadership on Water. He has also represented Canada internationally on notable water policy efforts at the UN and as Secretary General of the Interaction Council. For contributions to heritage, education, civics, and citizenship, Dr. Axworthy was invested in 2002 as an officer of the Order of Canada. Let us all please extend a warm Gray Street welcome to Tom. Well, I'm delighted to be with you uh, this morning, and I want to uh, compliment the choir on that uh, lovely anthem of being down by the river. And uh, indeed, the, uh, the worship committee as a whole, uh, with this very integrated program of prayers and hymns revolving around the theme of water. And I want to have a particular thanks to Gray Street United uh, for asking me to come to speak to you today because in preparation, I went back to a book, uh, Living Waters, written by my friend uh, Ian MacDonald, well-known minister uh, here in St. Augustine, uh, one of my oldest friends, uh, when I was a freshman attending, just starting at United College when it was run, now the University of Winnipeg, then, then an institution of learning run by the United Church. Uh, the first orientation session I went to, Ian MacDonald was there to mentor and to give fellowship to the incoming class and no one could have asked for anyone better funny, committed, playing the guitar. I said, if you could be like Ian MacDonald, university is gonna be fun. <laughs> and in looking at Ian's subsequent work and that particular book, which was done for the United Church, a series of prayers and, and uh, notations and facts about water, for the study in the Lenten period. 
it not only refreshed my knowledge about the spirituality of water and the connections, and I'll be speaking about that a little bit before I get into the substance of some of our water issues in Canada, but it also meant that it brought back memories of Ian and the time we had spent together with a, another good friend, Bob Haverluck, also a minister who, like Ian, uh, loves music and has written a radio play, The Trial of the Animals, uh, which is used in churches across the, this country. Uh, so I was so lucky among that uh, fellowship I had so long ago here. And also so interestingly to me that both of these dear friends became so engaged uh, in the environment and particularly around water, working with the United Church in the early 70s on the flooding issues caused by hydro uh, with our First Nations and ever since. So uh, thanks be uh, to this church for reminding me again of Ian and much of what I'll be speaking about with you this morning is inspired by that Lenten work of his. So when we begin to think about water in a spiritual context, and here we are in a United Church, water is mentioned nearly over 700 times in the Bible, more than prayer. Uh, it is one of the uh, dominant metaphors uh, that we have, particularly in the Hebrew Bible, but also in the New Testament, the reading we just had from John when uh, Jesus said, I will give you living water, drink, and you shall have eternal life. Now, there's a reason for that. Uh, in my career, I was lucky enough to work for Charles Bronfman, and that meant that I went to the Middle East and Israel about three or four times a year for nearly a decade. And so through that experience, was able to see the biblical sites and have interfaith dialogues in that uh, center of our three monotheistic religions. So, when you are in Israel, it, so much of it is desert and mountain, that when you come upon an oasis, when you come across running water, it's almost like a miracle, seems like a miracle. And therefore, it's entirely understandable why the authors of the various books of the Hebrew Bible Water to them was the Garden of Eden, because what they were used to was the dust of the desert. And so the first psalm talks about, if you follow my law and you follow the Lord, it will be like grounds watered to bring fruit and trees. The world for them. And indeed, my wife, Roberta, is with me uh, today, and we paid a visit once to a famous place called En Gedi, where David hid from Saul. And En Gedi is mentioned uh, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 47. And the reason it's mentioned is that as you pass the Dead Sea on the way to Masada, En Gedi is in the mountains hidden, but if you can climb that mountain, suddenly you hit a waterfall and vegetation and trees and paradise, hidden, but by the Dead Sea and on the road to Masado, the site of so much tragedy. And so Ezekiel wrote and actually used the words by En Gedi in his vision of the temple where the water would run from the temple and enrich Israel, so that by, like En Gedi, the fishermen would have many categories and varieties of fish, and the trees would bloom, and the grass would not wither. But that source of 
living water. And in contrast, that if one did not follow the Lord, the marshes would dry, the swamps would become salt, the Dead Sea. So Ezekiel knew of Ben Gideon, he knew of the Dead Sea and wrote about it. And 2,000 years later, we are still uh, mesmerized when you come to that incredible hidden spot of beauty with running water in the middle of a desert. And Jeremiah, who liked to wag his fingers at his fellow uh, Israelites, uh, also t talked about water as a central compact and that uh, the Lord said to him that people are turning away, forsaking me, and I am the fountain of living water. God saying to the Israelites in the highest metaphor that could be mentioned that I am living water, but you are following your own way of brackish water in cisterns. You're going the Dead Sea route. You're not going the living water route. And then we look at, again, John the Baptist, who called on the people of Jerusalem to come to the River Jordan to cleanse themselves and start anew. Nothing better than cleansing yourself in fresh water. And similarly uh, to my trip with Roberta to Engedi, I took my son on one of these trips, and we were in Jordan, Jordan proper, and heard cries. And, uh, and uh, when you're in the Middle East and you hear a loud noise and cries, it's sometimes not a happy experience. But we followed the noise to see what was happening. And we came upon a bend, and by the River Jordan, there were a group of nuns immersed in the water, singing for joy. It was a cry of joy, not a cry of fear, as they were in the River Jordan, as John the Baptist had, had so many of his people from his time in that water. So the, these people in the 20th century also experiencing the River Jordan. And then as we just had in our reading today, of course, water is throughout the life of Jesus. He jumped in that river with John the Baptist. Uh, his first disciples were fishermen. He taught on the Sea of Galilee. He washed the feet of his disciples. He turned water into wine. <laughs> and as Mary Magdalene was at the tomb, crying through her, her tears, Jesus came back and said, I am risen. Tell the others of the good news. And so Mary became the first apostle to the apostles in carrying the good news through that veil of tears. So the connections of water from the Hebrew Bible and from our own Christian tradition is that this is a resource to be valued almost beyond any other. I was in the Yukon a few years ago, and there was a sign which brought this home to me. There was a dispute over fracking, mining, oil, uh, but with some threats to the watershed. And, uh, and the First Nations tribe had a big sign as we walked into the meeting saying, if the water runs out, you can't drink oil. <laughs> and that was the same message uh, from the Hebrew prophets. And so when we look at this Canada of ours, we are the Eden that Ezekiel and Jeremiah and John the Baptist were talking about when we think of water as a resource. Just think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Canada has... 0.48% of the world's population, not even 1%, 0.48. We have 7% of the renewable water resources of the world. No country is more blessed with fresh water than this one. 
We have two million lakes. We have 8,500 rivers. This is a water paradise if we can keep it. But like Jeremiah's warning that living water can be turned into brackish water in cisterns, if we look at our stewardship of water, this bounty that God has given us, we begin to see that there are some difficulties and cracks quickly appearing in the water future of this country, despite the abundance that we have. There is the geological fact that though we have 7% of the renewal water, half of it flows north, where very few Canadians live. So that means that though the country as a whole has enormous resources, in certain parts of the country, the southern part of our country, there is great water stress. It sounds amazing that we suffer from drought in this country when we have so much, but it is not where the people are. And so, as I speak to you today, there are news stories about drought on the Sunshine Coast of British Columbia. They're rationing water. Breweries are closing down because there's not enough water. Uh, along uh, the Alber uh, in Alberta, around the South Saskatchewan, constant worries about drought. There's water stress, though we have, uh, Canadians are not possessed of this because of our views that, of the bounty of the water paradise that we are. But the stresses and cracks are very quickly appearing. We are part of a hydrological cycle that is making uh, water issues even more difficult with drought at one end of the spectrum, but flooding on the other. We we're getting hit by both sides. We had floods here in Manitoba this spring, $200 million worth. A few years ago, Calgary was inundated itself. I think that was uh, three to four billion with flooding. So a hundred year events as people used to talk about them on the weather, are now occurring every five or six. And so many of them are related to water, either the lack of, the droughts that we have in Canada, and overwhelmingly droughts across California, for example, or the massive floods, which we are getting more and more subjected to. So when we look at water issues in the country, generally. I could spend, uh, I, I teach courses on water, but I'm cognizant of time, so I just want to mention two or three of these major issues nationally, and then I'm going to speak about Lake Winnipeg. When we look at some of those national issues, in my plea to you today is that we have to be stewards and not exploiters of our water. Let's take first, groundwater, aquifers, okay? A third of Canadians, 10 million Canadians, rely on groundwater, the water that's not on the surface for drinking, for, for the very essence of life, okay? But there's an amazing fact about our groundwater resources in our country. We don't know really what's in them. We haven't mapped them. We know and we have mapped our oil and gas reserves very expertly, but we have not yet finish mapping our groundwater aquifers. We started years behind many other countries around the year 2000, uh, of saying that we would map and find out what was happening in the 30 largest aquifers in the country. Well, it's now 2022, we've done about 20, 10 more to go. We're not gonna finish it to 2030. And that's the first step, just what do we have in the ground? <laughs> Meanwhile, while we don't know what we have in the ground, provinces and municipalities are ripping that water out and they're letting Nestle pay peanuts to take out groundwater and put it into plastic bottles. Uh, in the work of the National Hydrology Service in looking at our groundwater uh, resources, they found, for example, that in one in Saskatchewan around Esteban, where where my, my mother uh, was uh, born quite cl uh, close to there, Esteban, um, that the aquifer had been so severely depleted uh, 
by the use of water for local electricity that it would take 20 years for that aquifer to replenish. But, and those aquifers, people got to drink them. So this is very serious stuff to be allowing commercial exploitation of, of aquifers when we don't know what's in them. But it's been going on for a long, long time. So we have a, a real issue around ground, groundwater and aquifers. I mentioned flooding and the vast amount of flooding that is occurring because of climate change. Canada is the only G7 country without a national flood insurance program. The only one. Uh, Canadians buy, many buy in floodplains. The last survey that was taken showed that only 6% of Canadians knew they were in a floodplain when they bought their new house in the, in the suburbs. Neither real estate agents nor insurance brokers are required to tell people about the flood risks of their home. Now, we can say people should check it out themselves, and yes, they should. But there are other jurisdictions uh, which, have, which have regulations so that people can help to know that information. In the UK, you can simply put in your postal code and you can come back with what is the flood risk in your area. We don't have that in this country, and yet we're paying hundreds and hundreds of millions in, in insurance costs around, uh, around uh, flooding. So we've got another second huge, large uh, national issue. Third, preservation, leaky pipes, okay? We're, with the fresh water we have, how much do we lose? A report came out this, this summer uh, about Ontario, but it applies here to do Manitoba as well, that about 10 to 15% of the water in Ontario municipalities is lost through leaky and old pipes, okay? Uh, now that means in Toronto, it's, it's 100 million liters of water daily, <laughs> okay? From the water that is lost in Toronto through leaky pipes, you could service a city of a quarter of a million people. That's just Toronto. That's not the rest of Ontario. There's a, a, a town outside of Ottawa called Smith Falls. 60% of its water is lost through leaky pipes. Our infrastructure, okay? We have the same situation here in Winnipeg just, just this winter. Of course, we had such a terribly cold winter, but uh, the water mains froze on Donald Avenue. <laughs> and and uh, water was stopped there, they burst. We have even potentially more of a problem than Ontario because of the, of, the, of the freezing issue. And yet, and we have an election, a municipal election in, in two or three days here, uh, but right across the country, municipalities don't have healthy tax resources that grow automatically, like sales taxes or income taxes, in order to put the money back into the infrastructure that we need to fix that pipe problem. So we certainly have a pothole problem in Winnipeg, but we got a pipe problem too. <laughs> and and we, beyond that, we got a municipal financing problem, okay? And very few of the candidates are running, I noticed, have addressed that fiscal issue. <laughs> it's the old game of promise, 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 and I'll pay for it somehow through the uh, good uh, hopes and dreams, all right? Um, uh, so we've got an infrastructure and a w water problem uh, issue. And then, of course, we all know about the water sharing issues, the, the fact of the boil advisories on First Nations and, and uh, how we share that water that we have. Okay? So these are big national issues that we've been very slow on the pickup on. Now, lastly, as I come to my conclusions, Lake Winnipeg. Lake Winnipeg is a microcosm of everything I've been talking about so far. It, is a, it just shows the bounty of the Lord. It's the 10th largest freshwater lake in the world. Uh, it's the size of Lake Erie or Lake Ontario close to. It is the Great Lakes of the prairies. Massive amount of, of its size. But that lake, with that massive size, the remnants of Lake Agassiz, millions of years ago, is being threatened. 
threatened so much that the uh, Global Water Organization said it's the world's most threatened lake. Okay, world class we are in Winnipeg. We have the world's most threatened lake. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and David Suzuki has been running documentaries on Lake Winnipeg. So what is happening? So let's just look at the way we have treated this incredible resource that we have in this province, okay? So uh, when I grew up uh, in the 60s and the 70s, the, uh, the lake was naturally replenished by the rivers that flew through it from the Nelson and so on. There was a natural cleansing in Lake Winnipeg. We didn't have algae blooms uh, when my grandfather ran a store up in Grand Beach. Uh, but this province then, and we collectively, made a decision to begin to dam those rivers, to turn it into hydropower. And so in Lake Winnipeg has now become a man-made, regulated, facility as opposed to a natural replenishment. Hydro began to regulate the, the lake for electricity and economic development. Uh, at the same time, then, uh, the lake no longer had the currents to replenish itself. Human beings interjecting themselves in the eco-cycle. Now, there's a good reason why we did that at the time. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not an environmental purist. You need jobs, you need prosperity, we need electricity. There's all, all those decisions could entirely be defended. But while we were doing that, uh, taking the economic uh, priority over the environmental, we then did nothing to try to balance that by additional investments around the environment. Instead, we then made it worse. We made it worse in this way, that, that no longer allowing the lake to clean itself, uh, then also for economic development, and I'm not against agriculture or farming, but Manitoba began a huge push to have more and more intensive animal farms, primarily pork, uh, to create industrial farms in Manitoba uh, at the same time as we took away the ability of the lake to regulate itself. So what does this mean? <laughs> this means that uh, uh, the immense amount of excrement, uh, which has phosphates, nitrogen, uh, pollutants of all kinds, just from that one resource, uh, was intensifying as the lake could no longer cleanse itself. The amount of phosphate nutrients has gone up over 70% from the 1990s to today. We're putting that much more stuff in a lake that can't, that can't clean itself, okay? There is so much phosphorus going into our lake uh, from animal and human that uh, some scientists say the amount of phosphorus we are creating is equivalent to if, if there were 50 million people in this province, okay? There isn't 50 million people, but that's how much phosphorus is coming off of the industrial farms and the sewage, untreated sewage. Uh, so a second large part of the picture of Lake Winnipeg. And then thirdly, as I, uh, as I've discussed, uh, climate change has made more and more intensive rainstorms and flooding. And when it floods, the fertilizer, uh, the, the, uh, the phosphorus, comes off of the land and right into the lake. And it's not just Manitoba, it's of course up from the Red River. So it's Montana and North Dakotas. I mean, it's happening everywhere in that basin. And that basin then is dumping it eventually into Lake Winnipeg. So it's not just Manitobans doing it to ourselves, but it's also with our American friends, okay? So this, this is a cycle of despair that human beings have interfered with the natural process. They've then put a primacy on the economic process uh, in terms of uh, uh, production. 
and uh, then are creating enormous algae blooms, which are also toxic. My nephew, uh, a few years ago, came to visit us at our cottage at Victoria Beach. Uh, and being a teenage boy, he had no sense whatsoever, so he jumped, in, he jumped into the lake when there was a toxic bloom, and that night I had to take him to, to the eMERGE. Okay? He poisoned himself. No, he, he, he recovered, but it's no fooling around how toxic these blooms are, as well as then sucking up the oxygen out of the lake and then eventually killing everything else all, all around it. So this 10th largest lake in the world is dying. Uh, we have done what Jeremiah feared. We have taken that living water and we're putting it into brackish water into cisterns. That's what we've been doing to Lake Winnipeg. Now, uh, there are cures in Europe. They have had remediation of lakes which have suffered the same kind of algae blooms as we are uh, seeing in Manitoba and Lake Winnipeg. Uh, Lake Constance in Switzerland. I have a very good friend uh, who is at Lake Constance, and he and I have been in pretty constant uh, interactions over the years on what they have done, the European Union. So the European Union put in 3 billion euros to fix Lake Constance. Uh, they think it will take 40 years to fix Lake Constance. And, but here's the kicker for us, ladies and gentlemen, Lake Winnipeg is 45 times larger than Lake Constance. That's what they have to do for this tiny lake. Think of what we have to do for Lake Winnipeg. So I want to end on a positive note. I don't want to be a Jeremiah. <laughs> don't want to be a Jeremiah. I want to be an Ezekiel, all right? The vision. <laughs> so when Wendy asked me to uh, come and have a talk with you in this service uh, in the late summer, the water community was generally in despair. That so little, had been, uh, there are reports after reports, task forces, it doesn't matter what party in Manitoba, NDP or conservative, I mean, they, the reports are that tall as I am and the lake gets worse every year. Uh, uh, so little action. But here's the good news. <laughs> here's the good news. That uh, from being asked in the summer to do this to now in October, two things have happened. Both, both good news. So the first, on the national front, okay? Uh, 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 Mr. Trudeau's government has talked about uh, creating the Canada Water Agency that we will finally have a water agency in Ottawa to give primacy to the those national problems that I just talked about, okay? From being a very low level priority, at least it, uh, it will have a chance to make its voice known and heard along with requisite kind of flooding. Now it's been a huge fight to get that done, to make it an independent body, much like the uh, uh, Parks Canada is an independent body with responsibility for keeping our parks going. Some of us have been arguing for some years now, I'm now a decade, that we need a Canada Water Agency, but hallelujah, <laughs> I think it's coming. <laughs> and, and we may have an announcement within a couple of weeks. So I would have been Jeremiah if this hadn't just happened, all right? <laughs> then we have something good news also on the lake, which is again, late August, there finally was an announcement that the federal government, the, the municipal government, and the province of Manitoba would come together to have an upgrade of the North End Sewage Treatment Center. So when I talked about the, the bad news on Lake Winnipeg, the single largest, I mean, there's uh, agriculture puts the most in, but it's individual farmers, the single largest amount of phosphate coming from the, putting into the lake at any one place was the North End plant because we weren't treating it. Now think about it. Winnipeg was not treating its sewage for decades at putting that stuff into the lake. And, uh, and uh, uh, it wasn't being done because people were worried about property tax. Uh, but this August, end of August, 
an announcement, there's going to be an upgrade. Uh, uh, the province has finally agreed to match the federal government, and, and uh, that work is going to start in 2023, and we hope it'll be done by 2027 or 2028, and Winnipeg, for the first time, will be treating its sewage that's going into Lake Winnipeg. Finally, the irresponsibility of this community will end. We're finally doing the right thing. Now, that's not the end of the solution of the problem. That's one piece of it, the Winnipeg piece. And that was, the, that was a great big piece, but there's still 90% to go, okay? The Lake Winnipeg Foundation has got an eight-point plan on what has to be done longer term to preserve that lake. Wetlands, for example. I, I, I talked about Ezekiel, who talked about the, the uh, swamps and the wetlands, okay, by the Dead Sea. Well, in Manitoba, we have rolled up or got rid of 75% of our wetlands. 75%. This is from Ducks Un Un Unlimited. We have to restore that natural boundary around the lake. We have to monitor its health. We have to deal with the sewage problem, which thankfully we're still doing, but there still are lots of other communities along the lake that are putting in untreated uh, sewage. We have to work with the agriculture community and individual farmers uh, to have better land management practices around their fertilizer, so we cut down putting phosphates in the lake. And with our American friends, since this is a joint problem, it starts down in Montana and South Dakota and comes up here, okay? Uh, though this is hard to do, but we have a Great Lakes Agreement with the United States on the Great Lakes in Ontario. We need a, a Winnipeg, uh, Lake Winnipeg Basin Agreement, if we can get it, with the States and the United States on an overall regulation. So like the Great Lakes Agreement, They'll put money in, we'll put money in, and together we'll try to um, prevent that lake from getting worse and hopefully turn it around to get it better. So I was going to end as I had begun by quoting Ian MacDonald on his wonderful hymn about Run uh, River Deep. And Ian in his book, Living Waters, did the same thing as the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible prophets. He used the metaphor of water and a running river to talk about life and death and redemption. But your worship committee has been ahead of me, and that's our very next hymn. So we will... Take the words of Ian MacDonald about the rivers running through us so that we can be refreshed and that we can all be Ezekiel's rather than Jeremiah's.
ever singing in you and me. Spirit of life, deep mystery, catch us up in your melody. River run deep, river run God provides. He shares with us every day the gifts of his creation. She brings us every day the gifts of healing. Sometimes healing our bodies, sometimes healing our souls, always the healing that we need, whether we recognize it or not. And we thank God for all of those gifts by sharing with others around us. We share our time, we share our talent. We share our treasure. You are invited now to share whatever gifts you have to offer. We long for the time when the meek shall inherit the earth, and all who hunger and thirst after justice shall be satisfied. And we believe that, despite the persistence of evil, now is always the time when more good can be done and we can make a difference. May, May it be so through the offering of these gifts and the offering of our lives. Amen. Holy God, whose spirit moved over the waters at the dawn of creation. Hear our prayers for all who thirst today. We pray for those who are spiritually thirsty, who long to know your presence, but don't know where to find you. We pray for those who are alone and without hope, those who long to feel needed and loved, those who are searching for meaning and purpose. O oh, healing river, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray for all who are physically thirsty, who don't have enough water to drink or feed their animals or fields are parched, whose crops have withered, those who have to walk long distances to find enough water to survive, or who have to be content with water that is unclean. We pray for those whose homes and villages are torn apart because of drought or famine. O oh, healing river, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray for those who are thirsty for justice, who long for equal sharing of resources among peoples and nations, those who put their lives at risk to protect streams and rivers and oceans, those who are working to find clean water and making it available to those who need it. Pour, o healing river, pour, pour down, down your, your waters, waters and, and heal our people. people. God, we ask that you would open your hearts to the needs of all who thirst. Give us courage to work together for justice to stand alongside those who are thirsty so that people everywhere may live without want or fear and may discover the abundant life you promise to each one. In the name of Jesus Christ, the source of living water, we pray. Amen. Amen. Will we join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> Our, Father, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy earth be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So, as we prepare to leave this place of worship, remember to be grateful for all the gifts of God's creation. Go out into the world with thankfulness in your hearts and be ready to offer thanks to all. When we love one another, when we thank one another, we are also loving and thanking God. And so, I thank you all for being a part of my family in Christ. May you feel the blessing and love and gratitude in your heart today and every day. To our honored guests, 
today, we want to leave you with our choral benediction. And we thought we'd help you out by learning some of the words. So here it goes, and I'm going to ask you to repeat after me and hope to God I get it right. <laughs> here we go. Ciso. Ciso. Ciso Hamba. Ciso Hamba. Ciso Hamba na ye. Ciso Hamba na ye. Ciso Hamba na ye. Ciso Hamba na ye. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Siso hamba na ye. That's good so far. Now here comes the good part. Okay. Gumshla. Gumshla. Wenja. Wenja. Gumshla. Wenja. Bula. Wenja. Bula. We're ready. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.